downside to the direct cycle method is that it's very easy for the air passing through the reactor core to become irradiated, either directly if the shielding is weak or if in the course of time with the, the heat and dynamic pressures uh, that the, the, the shielding begins to break down and the irradiated materials begin to flow out of the reactor core, in which case you are spewing dirty material at the back of the aircraft. That led the Atomic Energy Commission scientists to propose a second kind of atomic motor called the indirect cycle. The other approach was to have a reactor separate from the propulsion system, but on the airplane, of course, which would produce lots of, lots of energy, heat. Then that energy would be transferred from the reactor to a propulsion unit, a jet-like propulsion unit, through the use of, uh, of hot liquid metals. The indirect cycle has the advantage that you avoid passing the air through the reactor. Therefore, you're going to avoid the problem of any irradiated materials exiting the plane. So what you have to do is to have some medium between the air and the hot reactor, some other substance that will pass from the hot reactor, taking heat, and transfer it to the air. But that means a lot of plumbing, and it's very heavy, and it's difficult for an aircraft. There were now two competing atomic motors, the simple but more dangerous direct system and the safer but complex and heavier indirect system. In the race to build the first atomic engine, the General Electric Company opted for the direct cycle, the, the simpler though potentially dirty system. The Pratt & Whitney Company opted for the indirect cycle, safer but more complex to engineer. While testing of the NB-36 continued and work on the nuclear engines got underway, General LeMay and the Air Force drew up plans for a real atomic bomber. Two, one, zero. In the 1950s, the new technology of ballistic missiles was still in its development phase. Rockets were not yet reliably accurate and there was also an aversion towards the pilots of the 50s becoming the so-called silo-sitters of the 60s. Many people within the Air Force, especially the older experienced people, uh, simply favored airplanes over missiles, and the nuclear airplanes seemed like, you know, in that sense, it was a godsend. The big advantage that people saw for nuclear-powered aircraft was simply that the flight duration could be extended indefinitely. That meant the range could be any, anything you wanted. It means they could stand on station if they were for defensive or observational purposes. The new atomic-powered bomber would look very different from its predecessors. It was called the WS-125. Design and construction of the aircraft was entrusted to Convair, builders of the B-36. The Air Force developed a lot of formal administrative techniques and one was to classify programs, and, and WS just stands for weapon system, and uh, they all had numbers, and the uh, WS-125 was a nuclear airplane. The plan was for the WS-125 to be operational in the early 1960s. It was never given a B for bomber number, but could have been the B-72. The WS-125 would have a reactor situated in the main body of the aircraft, feeding two jet engines. It would carry atomic bombs or cruise missiles. The crew would be in a shielded front cockpit. Operationally, the WS-125's mission then would be to stand off uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, uh, hanging around the Arctic Circle for days, if not weeks on end, ready to dash in and hit Soviet cities. This nuclear-powered air fleet would be limited only by the endurance of its flight crews. While work continued on the nuclear engines, the NB-36 testbed grappled with another problem, shielding the crew from radiation. The normal lead shielding used in atomic power plants was going to be too heavy to put in an aircraft. It would slow the plane down making it vulnerable to fighter attack. The answer was distributed shielding, or shadow shielding. Instead of having all the shielding in one place, 
you might have some of it around the reactor, but you might also have some around the pilots. In an earthbound reactor, you simply surround the reactor with, with lead, which slows down the, the various uh, nuclear particles that are flying off. Can't do that on, a, on an aircraft because you need lightweight shielding. So what they decided to do was to sort out the different kinds of atomic particles that would be loosed off from the reactor, discover different kinds of shielding, uh, lightweight shielding that would block each, and distribute around the aircraft these different kinds of shielding. Keeping the weight of the aircraft within manageable proportions now became the overriding priority of the project. The ANP continued to focus on the key problem, which was getting the weight of the whole system down. They did this in two ways. One was the divided shield concept, where they were continually trying different tweaks and different materials uh, in, in order to improve the efficiency of that. The second way they looked at was decreasing the reactor size. Uh, the only problem with decreasing reactor size is that in order to keep the performance the same, you have to increase the temperature so that you end up with the same amount of thrust produced by the smaller engine. But progress on all fronts, engine, shielding, reactor power, was slow. And the atomic bomber now had a rival. The US Navy, always jealous of the Air Force, had started its own atom-powered plane project. What the Navy did is it went back to the idea of the original MIT team of the 1940s who talked about flying boats. So the Navy decided an atomic-powered flying boat would be a very good idea. It, it would be peculiar if nobody in the Navy thought about using a nuclear reactor for a flying boat, as long as the Air Force is thinking about it for something else. The Navy wanted a nuclear-powered version of the Martin Seamaster, the world's first jet-powered seaplane. But to defeat its Air Force rival, the US Navy also sought British aid. The British already had a giant flying boat capable of carrying the weight of a nuclear reactor, the Saunders Row Princess. The US Navy Bureau asked Saunders Row to provide a, a brochure study of putting a nuclear power unit into the, into the Princess flyboat for use by the US Navy. And I seem to remember a sum of $50,000 being paid to us to do the work, and we, which we did and delivered not only a brochure but a, a model of the airplane. Dick Stratton was in charge of flight testing the Princess. The main thing was to install um, a nuclear reactor in the upper deck, which would feed hot gases to the inboard power plants. And the aircraft would take off on turbine fuel, and when it was up and away, they would then switch off the turbines and go over to the nuclear-powered turbines on the big inboard engines. And, of course, it would stay up for as long as you wanted it to stay up. But the US Navy quickly abandoned nuclear-powered flying boats in favor of another nuclear-powered weapon system, the atomic submarine. The great advantage of the nuclear-powered sub was that you could use the heavy lead shielding in the submarine. Weight was not a problem. And therefore, you could also carry a much bigger reactor. And you could shield the crews uh, of the nuclear submarine so it, like the uh, proposed nuclear bomber, could sit undetected, underwater, off the coast of uh, the United States even to fire its missiles, or off the coast of Russia to fire shorter range missiles, or indeed almost anywhere in the world to provide that independent and safe nuclear deterrent. The two projects, the Air Force's atom-powered plane and the Navy's atomic subs, were now deadly rivals. One of the inspirations the Air Force had for building a nuclear airplane was that the Navy had a nuclear submarine and they weren't about to be left out in this uh, high-tech propulsion area. But the reality was that the atomic bomber program was in crisis. In 1956 there was some good news and some bad news for the atomic powered project. Um, General Electric Company at last managed to get uh, a nuclear powered jet engine prototype working. Uh, but the bad side was that uh, the thrust produced was nowhere near enough to lift the whole system off the ground. The Air Force and General Electric now sought more money for the atomic bomber program. But they were to run up against an unexpected obstacle. President Dwight D. Eisenhower. 
President Eisenhower